Hi, I'm excited to talk with you now about drug development. So I'm hoping that by the end of this video that it'll help to understand the stages of the FDA drug development uh, program and the approval process. To understand who the stakeholders are in drug development process and to understand the different ways that a drug can be developed for use in pulmonary hypertension, we'll focus on two main ways, what we call de novo drug development that I'll explain in a minute, and drug repurposing. So why is it important to understand or gain more information about the drug development process? Well, understanding the different stages of the drug development process can be helpful to you because it can relieve anxieties you may have about looking into the process of being involved in clinical research or a study. There are so many myths and misconceptions about being involved in a study, and this video will help to decipher some of those. This will help you understand that approved medications, devices, biologic products have gone through a really lengthy and in-depth process to be deemed safe and useful for patients. It's also a good source of information to have for curious minds. Moreover, it'll help to explain why the process takes so long. So many people wonder, why aren't there more things coming up faster? And hopefully this will help to explain that. So let's start with some of the stages of the FDA drug development and the approval process. So there are several stages. I'll tell you about each of these in a minute. Drug discovery is the first stage. Then there's the preclinical stage. After that, a drug goes through clinical testing. And there's three phases of that, phase one through three. And then it goes up in front of the FDA for review. After that, there's post-marketing studies, which are called phase four studies. Along the way, there's a huge amount of attrition. For the thousands of drugs that are initially developed, there may be one that makes it all the way through this process. Drug discovery is the first step in this whole process. With drug discovery, there has to be a target for the drug. As we learn more about the chemical pathways that contribute to the development of pulmonary hypertension, we learn more about how we can block those pathways. Something that blocks a pathway we would call an antagonist medicine. There also are chemical pathways that protect people from pulmonary hypertension. So we want to know how do we enhance those pathways and make them work more. A medicine that enhances a pathway we call an agonist. So we develop a compound that affects that target. We start with molecular building blocks. We have to show that the compound is stable, that it's not going to evaporate or go away quickly. And then figure out how is it going to be packaged and delivered to someone so that it gets to the point of the body where you want it to get to. That whole process is incredibly complicated. There are different methods and approaches to drug development and discovery. I mentioned de novo drug development and drug repurposing. To differentiate between those two, I'll tell you about first de novo drug development. This is when you take a drug all the way through all the steps of drug discovery, all the way up to FDA approval. This process commonly takes 12 to 15 years. The final cost, can be in the billions of dollars for one drug that makes it all the way through this process. There's often an intent to commercialize, and the final cost can be in the billions of dollars. This is different from drug repurposing. With drug repurposing, you're taking an existing FDA-approved medication, and you're repurposing it for a new indication or new disease. Most of the time, you're skipping drug development by doing this. Often you can skip some of the preclinical or basic science work as well. And the intent can be either for commercialization or philanthropic, meaning that once the science is done, that the medication can be prescribed off-label or without a new cost or charge. So preclinical research is usually summarized by studies that are done either in vitro or in vivo. So these two terms, in vitro and in vivo, uh, in vitro means that you're doing the work outside of the body. An example is cell cultures. So for example, in the blood vessels of the lungs, some of the cells that are found there are called endothelial cells. And those endothelial cells from pulmonary arteries can be cultured and you can see the effects of a drug that would be what it would have directly on these endothelial cells. This contrasts with in vivo research, which is done in living things such as animal models. There's been tons of work for many decades that's gone into perfecting animal models that, while they aren't exactly like it is in people, are trying to get it as close as possible. There also are mice who have genes knocked out, 
And by knocking out those genes that are important for the development of pulmonary hypertension, you can then study the effect of a medication on these mice and see if you can alter the course of pulmonary hypertension in mice. So we do this research in preclinical studies to see if it's safe in these animals and to see if it works or is effective. After the preclinical phases in approval, then we head into clinical trials. The first phase of clinical trials is phase one. So phase one often includes a study that's prospective. What that means is you're moving forward or looking ahead. You don't know the results. The data is going to be collected as you go. So someone agrees to be in a phase one study and you follow them forward over some time as they take the medication. The main goal of a phase one study is usually to see if it's safe, to make sure that it's well tolerated and to find out more about which dose of medicines are safe and to try to get an understanding of, does it seem to be effective? You aren't going to find the total answer about if it's an effective treatment for pulmonary hypertension or another disease in phase one research, but you may start to get some clues. Phase one studies often involve a small number of patients, and so they often occur in a single center, meaning one hospital uh, or one hospital system. They may also combine forces with several hospitals and form a small multi-center study. A phase one study can involve single administration of a drug just one time, or it can involve repeated administration of a drug over many months. So again, the main thing that a phase one study is trying to answer is, is this medication safe? And maybe to get a signal about whether or not it's effective. The next step is phase two research. A phase two study is a larger study. It's often placebo controlled. What that means is that some people will be taking the actual medicine and that some people will be taking a placebo or sugar pill. You know the placebo won't have any effect on the person, so you're looking to see if there's a difference between these two groups, the group that takes the placebo and the group that gets the medication. To decide who's in which group, the process is randomized. That means it happens totally at random, that if I'm one of the scientists doing the research, I'm not going to know if the person who's in the study is getting the placebo or the medication. That means that I'm blinded to it, and the patient's also blinded, so they aren't going to know if they're getting a placebo or the actual medication. So as phase two studies conclude, you get additional safety information, but you're really trying to get at the heart of, does this medication seem to work? Does it make a difference compared to placebo? Is there something pointing in a positive direction? The next step is a phase three study. A phase three study is a complicated, expensive study that usually involves many hospitals, often from across the world. This is especially true for pulmonary hypertension studies because not as many people are affected by pulmonary hypertension as they are by diabetes and other more common conditions. So the time a medicine is started in a phase three study, it's getting close to approval. A phase three study has to be very well designed, very purposeful, and the primary outcome, meaning the main thing that scientists decide this is going to prove, it has to be chosen beforehand. So again, this is a prospective study, meaning that you're looking forward, you're assigning people to be on a placebo or the medication, and you're following forward over time to see how they do. These people are randomized to be in either the placebo arm or group or the medication arm, and everyone is blinded, double blinded. So the scientists are blinded, the people in the study are blinded. These studies can take years to conclude. In pulmonary hypertension, there's been a slow move in terms of what is the main thing that we're going to look for is valuable to uh, showing that this medication works. Years ago, we really were focusing on the six minute walk. If that would improve, we would say, okay, this medication was effective at treating it. There's been a slow move towards saying, okay, we wanna know more about does it decrease the number of hospitalizations that people have? Does it decrease the number of emergency room visits? Uh, does it slow the decline in health or accelerate recovery of health? And we've gotten better at measuring those things and those have become more common outcomes that will follow in phase three clinical trials. At the end of that, if everything is still promising, the medication has to go up for FDA review. The FDA will review all the clinical information It'll consider the disease state, the need for medications, et cetera. For example, they may consider pulmonary hypertension a relatively rare condition with 13 existing medications and wonder, well, why do you need more medications? But behind that, they'll be aware that the existing medications to treat pulmonary hypertension are very expensive. 
they're relatively high in side effects, they're often difficult to administer, and they'll be anxious to get new medications that improve on the existing medications. The FDA will do a careful review of safety as well as a careful review of the efficacy or seeing how well it works. They'll also consider the brand name that's being assigned to it, et cetera, and at the end of that, they may grant approval. After approval, there's post-marketing surveillance, which is considered phase four research. So the reason that phase four research is really important is that when we do these big phase three studies before FDA approval, we may get hundreds of people into the clinical trials and pulmonary hypertension studies. However, after approval, thousands of people are likely to take the medication. So you may find out much more information about how safe is it and what are common side effects that people have with the medication from studying it in thousands compared to studying it in hundreds. You can also learn a lot about how easy it is to take it after FDA approval because there's so many people you can learn more about how compliant are people with it and, and start to learn the difficulties that people have with it. I want to take you through a couple examples of drug development and pulmonary hypertension. I went over that there are two different types of drug development, de novo drug development and repurposing. A great example of de novo drug development is epoprostenol. This story was the culmination of 50 years of basic science research. John Vane was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1982 for discovering the chemical prostacyclin. We figured out how to package prostacyclins as medications, and that's what epoprostenol is. The clinical testing in phase three was the first time that a medication was shown to have a mortality benefit, meaning people live longer when they took it, for patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. As a result of all the years of science that went into it, the complexity of the medication and the delivery device, it's an expensive treatment and also a difficult medication to administer. I also want to give an example of repurposing. A good example of that is sildenafil. So sildenafil was actually initially studied for use with angina or high blood pressure. But along the way, it was found that it was effective for treating erectile dysfunction and was branded as Viagra and gained FDA approval as a treatment for erectile dysfunction. Years later, it was learned that this was going to be a good treatment for pulmonary hypertension. And there's a big effort between the Pulmonary Hypertension Association, other organizations, and the pharmaceutical industry to repurpose it for pulmonary hypertension. But this is an example of repurposing that was determined by chance. So with de novo drug development, it's very time consuming. It's very expensive. The products are therefore likely to be very expensive. Industry has often taken the lead in drug development, industry meaning the pharmaceutical industry. And the result of a lot of this de novo drug development has been pulmonary vasodilator therapy. I mentioned the 13 medications that are FDA approved. Those are all pulmonary vasodilator therapies. With drug repurposing, it's a little bit different. There are thousands of FDA approved medications and each medication may have several different ways that it can work or mechanisms of action. We are rapidly learning more about why people get pulmonary hypertension. What is the physiology or the chemistry behind why people get pulmonary hypertension? We're sort of going through an explosion of genetic information, of learning more about how genes are expressed into proteins, about how metabolism affects pulmonary hypertension. So with drug repurposing, we can learn new knowledge about how pulmonary hypertension develops in our body, improved understanding about how existing medications work, and then decision to use an existing medication used for another disease, and then attempt to develop it for pulmonary hypertension. So it takes a lot of knowledge to take an existing medication and figure out that it may be a promising therapy for pulmonary hypertension. So a good example of drug repurposing in pulmonary hypertension is anastrozole. Before it was determined that this may be a good therapy for pulmonary hypertension, it took a lot of background research. It took years of realizing that hormones are important in the development of pulmonary hypertension and that some of the byproducts of these hormones or metabolites may be equally important. This knowledge about hormones helped to understand why women are more likely to develop pulmonary hypertension than men. It led to careful selection of anastrozole as a potential medication to help people with pulmonary hypertension. Anastrozole is FDA approved for breast cancer and it's a relatively inexpensive medication which makes it a good choice for repurposing.
it blocks an enzyme called aromatase. And by doing that, that decreases one of the essential byproducts or metabolites of estrogen called estradiol. So by deciding that this may be a useful therapy in people with pulmonary hypertension, you skip some of that drug development phase and you limit the preclinical or basic science work. So that's one example of many examples of repurposing and pulmonary hypertension. There are over 10 different medications that are currently in the pipeline in various stages of development for repurposing. One common thread with all these medications is that they're different from the existing FDA-approved medications. I told you that the FDA-approved medications, their job is to dilate the blood vessels in the lungs and relax them. Many of the medications that are currently being repurposed are trying to do the next step up from this. They're trying to specifically target the underlying chemical pathways or cells that are creating pulmonary hypertension and to treat those problems. So challenges to drug development, with de novo drug development, expense is a big challenge. Time, I mentioned that it can take 12 to 15 years. That's a big challenge. While it's oftentimes a benefit, it can also be a challenge that industry is leading and it's difficult for academics sometimes to take the initiative in de novo drug development due to the time and the expense. And there's a narrow stream of products in general that's focused around pulmonary vasodilating action. With drug repurposing, there are different challenges. How do you get funded to afford to do these studies? It's a big challenge. It's a very complicated process to be led by academic investigators who often don't understand how all the different parts and pieces in drug development fit together. There are more efforts to connect investigators with human resources and financial resources that are needed to succeed in this, so there's a lot of promise. And there's a growing number of support systems within academic institutions and separate from that with institutions like Cures Within Reach. So where do we go from here? We need more awareness of the pulmonary hypertension studies that are already out there, and we need action on behalf of funders, researchers, and participants. So please continue watching the video series to find out more about where to look for available trials. Thanks for joining us.